Welcome. I want to welcome everyone to um, the second night of The Dig, a contemporary speakeasy. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Last week, I was fortunate to launch the series. And now I get to, well, 13 nights, I get to sit and listen to all the great stories. I will be doing another presentation uh, later in the season um, on Marion and Della Knuckles, the two women who were first in the United States to be appointed uh, C-level executive jobs at the then the Knuckles Packing Company in 1928. And I've been working with their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and acquiring materials and have just been given three decades of private letters between the two women, and it's extraordinary. I mean, conversations with the Hormel family. I mean, when you talk about meat, these women, literally, they were the kingpins with J.C. Hormel. So that's gonna be a fun uh, lecture. I'm actually doing some research because we have some filmmakers that are interested in doing an entire series on just the two women alone, and the more that I learn, the more that I wanna share. But tonight, I'm fortunate to introduce you to Laurel Campbell, um, Laurel was really instrumental in getting me to understand Pueblo history um, because she really pointed to, we kind of get caught up sometimes with all of the empire builders, the Guggenheims, the Rockefellers, many of those people who left their footprint here for the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. But uh, Laurel said, you need to go deeper. You need to look back and dig into Pueblo's history. So I'm really fortunate to be able to introduce Laurel and I'm gonna read you, there is a bio, but I sit with Laurel on the Historic Preservation Commission, and I've only been on the commission for just a few years. I don't know how many, how many years have you been on? Se eight years now? So, um, and Jason Falsetto is with us this evening, and Jason is the current chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. And one thing that's really exciting is we've got an amazing group of commissioners, young and old, uh, male, female, just about every interest covering, you know, apartments to genealogy to meatpacking plants to, you know, contemporary issues that we're dealing with, like the Conservancy District and the Levy Project. So Laurel Campbell um, is the chair of the Goodnight Barn Historic Preservation Com Committee and president of its nonprofit. I wanna make sure I get all of these titles because sometimes I can't remember them all. But she had a very um, amazing career um, as a li licensed legal assistant. And uh, as I said earlier, she's a commissioner with the Pueblo Historic Preservation Commission. She's also served as the um, board for um, the Historic Pueblo Inc. And she twice served as their president. She's currently the president of the Pueblo Heritage Museum and has spent many hours researching Pueblo's huge and important history. So our tagline for this whole dig series, a contemporary speakeasy, is Pueblo leaves you speechless and then turns you into a storyteller. So the whole point, as I said last week, which I think is worth repeating, is that we're all kind of crawling out of our pandemic caves. And one of the things that we can do, whether you're blue or red or anywhere in between, is that we can break bread and we can share stories. And I've only been in Pueblo for 10 years and it's amazing. I keep lifting up rocks and finding new stories, new people. And so for us, this is a great opportunity to share our stories here in Pueblo. So with that, I give you the mic, Laurel. Good evening. Um, at the very last minute, I changed from my cowboy boots to loafers because uh, I knew I was going to have an issue with all that. So anyway, um, I am Laurel Campbell, and I get to skip all the part that uh, uh, Gregory just talked about. And so I can just go right to a little bit uh, older bio. Is I'm from Deerfield, Illinois, which is on the north shore of Chicago. And I always had an interest in history. I was the only one that asked my, asked my elderly uh, relatives what was going on. Uh, so when I started doing genealogy is when I really got interested in history. And everywhere I've lived, and it's been several, several places, I've enjoyed it. But I always came back to Pueblo. It's an awesome, 
awesome place. Um, as the chairperson of the Goodnight Barn Committee, I am truly um, blessed because it has been seven years that I ate, drank, whatever, good night. And um, you would be surprised how much I can remember and how much I forget. So I do cheat and use some notes, just want to let you know that. And it's not a short presentation, but there's an awful, uh, awful lot of great slides for you to enjoy. And I've been given this clicker and told that it works different than every other, so I'll probably shut off the, the show several times. <laughs> Anyway, okay. No? Okay, I did, oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, this was our logo, and it was designed by Kim Mackey. If you know Kim, he's a local Western artist, and I saw a, a picture of one of his uh, steers, and I said, oh, I want that. He said, okay, I'll give you one. Maybe longer than we think. What's going on? I'm back to that. Guys, am I doing something wrong? Well, this okay. Are we going? Oh, we're going backwards. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so that you know uh, that the barn has uh, committee has been together about seven years and it took us nearly that long to raise the 1.2 million dollars it took to restore this barn and um, I, I knew it had been started and stopped many times and I decided I just wasn't going to let it stop this time we were going to follow it through and it's taking a good portion of my retired life so far I didn't know I was going to have a handheld mic so it might be a little uh, this is the barn in, in 1974. It was the year that it was put on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it is stone. When you drive by it, a lot of people think that it's adobe, but it is a stone barn. And it actually was built from a quarry that, that Goodnight owned. He owned a lot of that area there. If you don't know, you'll know now, that the story of Goodnight and his partner Loving was uh, presented in a book published in 1985 by Larry McMurtry. And he uh, wrote Lonesome Dove, and I call it the Western saga of Gone with the Wind. That's how enchanting and wonderful it is. If you have not read the book, you need to do so. In 1989, it became a miniseries, and it was um, critically acclaimed and it's still popular as of today. On the left is Robert Duvall. He plays Gus and Gus is actually Oliver Loving. And then on the right is Tommy Lee Jones and he, his, he is called um, Captain Call and he is Goodnight. And of course the names are different but Larry took a lot of license with this but did a wonderful job. I don't know how many people have seen it but if you have, you know, doggone well, you need to tell everybody else to see it. So, funny, funny, too. So, this is just a scene from Lonesome Dove. I believe it was supposed to be San Antonio, but they sure fit the part. And it wasn't a goofy western. It was really made to uh, look real. Um, Charles was born in 1836 in Macoupin County, Illinois, and at the age of 10, his family moved to Texas. Texas was only 10 years old as a republic at that point. And uh, he was impressionable at that age, and he met a Caddo Indian, and they called him Caddo Jack. And uh, Caddo taught him tracking, let me see, uh, hunting, tracking, trapping, and made him an outdoorsman. And uh, he, that was invaluable to him. It, it would ab obviously ruin, uh, rule the rest of his life. In, um, and then he, after a, a few years, he went to Waco and started freighting. This was another thing he needed to learn for his future. At some point after that, um, he and Wesley, his uh, brother-in-law, or excuse me, stepbrother, step decided that cattle were free in the area. They were running loose and uh, that they would start catching their own cattle and maybe have a little herd. And that was all fine and well until they were stolen by Indians. So they had to start over again. Whoops. Uh, you know, it seems like something's missing here, but I guess not. Anyway, this is Charles Goodnight's mother. 
And in 1857, she needed a home to fit her family in. And so Charles and Wesley went and built her this log home uh, in Palo Pinto County at Black Springs with uh, two chimneys on the uh, chim chim chimneys of buttressing each side. And at that same time, he got interested in um, the Texas militia. And he wasn't very old at that point. He also was, uh, uh, became a Texas Ranger. And they were very new at that point, And they were the law of Texas at that point. Um, at one point, he was tracking. And he tracked a trail of Peter Nicona's uh, encampment, Comanche encampment, and saw that uh, Cynthia Parker was a captive there. And she was well known. She was um, captured at the age of 12. And we believe she was probably near 30. At th that's how long she'd been with them. And she also was the mother of Quana Parker. That's a famous name, Comanche chief. And uh, so they rescued her. And the funny thing about it was she didn't want to go. <laughs> she liked the life, and she wanted to go back. And she, they, w they didn't let her go back, and she didn't live a whole lot longer. She was extremely unhappy. At the time uh, that Goodnight was, uh, after he built the house for his mother and joined the Frontier uh, Regiment, uh, at that point, people were coming back from the Civil War. And the men had left and just left their herds to roam free because there was nobody to take care of them. So when he, and he decided that he was going to join a huge band of men and go out and rein, uh, rein in these uh, cattle, they were mostly... I'm pretty sure they were almost all Longhorns, and begin his own Longhorn herd. At that point, he, uh, he met Oliver Loving. And Oliver Loving was his senior by at least 12 years, maybe older than that. I might have been 20. Anyway, he was an experienced cattleman. He had taken drives to Chicago, uh, and he'd gone to Denver. And so he decided this man was his mentor. And they definitely hit it off. Um, he, uh, they had established the Goodnight Loving Trail, which went from uh, Fort Belknap to Fort Sumner. And this was a little information from a book that I, I want to read to you about the cattle. The cattle were free to whomever made the effort to run them down, corral them, and brand them. This made it easy and affordable to choose longhorns, but there were several other good reasons. When Good, when good Night and, Lo and Loving decided to push cattle, um, north, they looked for cattle that could withstand. Excuse me. Oh, oh what did I do? <laughs> Sorry, knew I was going to do that. I told you. Okay. So uh, they went and, and they they gathered a huge herd. They had, I don't know, two thousand twenty five hundred free cattle. And so um, it made it easy and affordable to choose Longhorns. And when Goodnight and Loving decided to push herds north, they looked for cattle that could trail long distances on little water and eat just about anything. Longhorns were considered Texas cattle, a combination of Spanish and Southern stock, and they were wild. Their horns were long and keen, set forward to kill like a bison. Goodnight said, as trail cattle, their equal has never been known and never will be. Their hoofs are superior to those of any other cattle, in stampedes, they hold together better and circle easier in a run and rarely split off when you commence to turn the front. Cowboy talk. Uh, no animal of the cow kind will shift and take care of itself under all conditions as will the longhorns. They can go farther without water and endure more suffering than others. They also are better mothers and have a keener sense of smell, and that'll be important later. Uh, their longhorns were used for cutting through formidable brush and their longer legs for stepping over and around rocks and f climbing out of arroyos. This is a composite that obviously was put together by somebody of Goodnight and Loving. Uh, Goodnight in his older years, Loving about the time that he joined Goodnight. The trail that, oh, it's kind of skipping. 
I'm sorry. There should be a, a, a map of the, uh, the trail, which was a backwards J. And they started at Fort Belknap and went n south and then up. And the reason they did that was because there was uh, a, a lot of uh, Comanche raids in the area straight across in the Panhandle, and they also had uh, very little water in some areas. So they chose a route where they might have more water and less Comanche raids. Some of my uh, slides are not coming up. Do we know why? Hmm. Well, we'll just... Okay. I had a, a nice pic. Well, this is one arm Bill. And one arm Bill Wilson uh, went on the third cattle drive with uh, Loving and Goodnight. And what happened was, at some point, Loving decided he was going to split off, go to Fort Sumner, and have um, uh, make an agreement, a contract to sell the beef. Uh, Navajo and Apache were being held there, and um, they needed beef to feed them. So they split off and went ahead, and at some point during their travel, they were attacked by a Comanche uh, group, and Loving was shot through the arm. And, and one-armed Bill, when it was clear, went to get Goodnight, which would have been south, and some, uh, a, a group of Mexicans in a wagon found Loving and took him on to Fort Sumner. Which kind of looked like this in the 1860s. Adobe, block, very fort looking, western fort looking. Loving's arm began to putrefy and he got gangrene. And when he got to the, the fort, the doctor said, the arm has to come off or you're going to die. And he refused to let them do it. About that time, Goodnight caught up and got to Fort Sumner and tried to talk him into having his arm amputated, but he refused. So on his dying, on his deathbed, he asked his good friend Goodnight to please take his body back to Weatherford, Texas and bury him there. And Goodnight said, I will do that. And he died with that peace of mind, knowing that that was where he was going to be. Uh, Goodnight buried him temporarily at Fort Sumner and then headed north with the rest of the cattle drive. And on his way back, he stopped and uh, exhumed the body. He made a coffin that was lined with tin cans that were all connected and put in charcoal and the body to help it so it wouldn't, uh, I guess, putrefy too quickly. And he did take him back to Weatherford and buried him there. And that's his headstone. He was buried on, um, let's see, March 27th, 1867. Traveling the trail was hot, dusty, and uncomfortable. And Goodnight knew he had to feed his crew, which ranged anywhere from 16 to 20 men. And cooking out on the open uh, prairie worked, but it took a lot of time. And so he and his mother, I have to mention this because not a lot of books do, he and his mother designed the chuck box. And in 1866, he took a Studebaker army wagon, which was much heavier than most, and he put a chuck box on the back, of the, on the back end. And he, uh, the mother, of course, was the one that actually knew exactly what was needed. She'd cooked for years. So the... Uh, there was a hinge lid that came, came down here and opened up to be a table. And it was uh, loaded with all sorts of, of uh, boxes, hinges, brackets, a coffee, a, a, excuse me, let's go back, a coffee grinder and two or three days worth of water. Water was a scarce commodity and they had to be very careful with it. Also, he controlled the liquor, the cookie. And it was used for mostly for uh, medicinal purposes. So, <laughs> well, I can tell you that Goodnight did a lot did not allow drinking, gambling, or swearing on the trail. And I think that's funny because he sure did a lot of that himself. So. Uh, the trail camp was always 
probably pretty uh, simple. Uh, I'm sure they look for trees when they could find them, but the prairie doesn't have a lot of trees. Uh, so they hung a, a canvas underneath and hauled all the bedrolls and the wood and, and kindling because that was very hard to find on the open prairie. And the cook would start off in the morning as they were getting the herd together and travel ahead probably 10 to 15 miles. They figured out how far they could go. And um, he would, uh, on along the way, pick up supper. And you would think that a beef would be what they'd be eating all the time. But that was money on the hoof to good night. They did not s uh, kill them unless they were absolutely desperate. So what did they eat? Uh, when I give this uh, uh, story to presentation to the schools, the kids all go, ooh, because they'll say rattlesnake and prairie chicken. But they ate what they could find. And perishables were very dear to them if they ever came near a town and could buy fruits and vegetables. They probably had rickets by the time. <laughs> right, doctor? <laughs> um, and that is a, a standard picture of evening at, at, at camp. Um, I can tell you that, um, I don't know, I think maybe I have the wrong PowerPoint, but it still is going to get us where we need to go because the caption on this was, was uh, bulls and beans and because they ate an awful lot of beans. So. This is uh, the holdings of Goodnight, and it, it kind of, uh, it was part of the Nolan Grant, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can see it, it crossed Fremont and Custer County. Oh, there we have it. There's the, <laughs> there's the map. Uh, you can see how it was a backwards J, and they started it at uh, Fort Belknap and went up, and the Pecos River was what they were aiming for. This is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Miano Estacado. It's the Staked Plains, and it was 90 miles of waterless plateau. And this was the hardest thing for them to get the cattle across because there was no water for them. And it was named in, uh, by the Spanish as they came up exploring and uh, couldn't see any kind of, of uh, landmark, which landmarks were huge in the West at that point. So they put in stakes, they drove stakes into the ground to find their way back. This is kind of a neat picture. You can see nothing but prairie. So he was, they were very smart. Um, as they came to the Pecos River, uh, it, it took them four days to cross the Ayano. And the cattle were crazy. Uh, you know, they were going crazy. They needed water. And so the cowboys were not allowed to let them lay down or stop. They pushed them the whole way. And about seven miles from water, they smelled it. Remember I said they had a great sense of smell. They smelled it and bolted and ran for seven miles. I'm not sure how they did that, but the problem was at the other end, there were bluffs. And they pushed the, the, uh, for the front of the herd over the bluff and they lost, they drowned, they, they drowned, broke their legs, uh, they lost, someone said 500 cattle. I don't know if that's true, but they pushed on with about 2,000 of them. And Horsehead Crossing has always had a dire uh, name. I mean, everybody thought it was a dangerous place. So drovers on the job, this is them pushing the, the herd forward. And um, a lot of, if you've ever seen uh, or read Centennial, young kids were on the drives. They, they learned to be a man on those, on those drives. A stampede was one thing you did not want to happen. And what happened was a sudden noise, a gunshot, uh, lightning, strong wind, a storm, and they would start running. And the problem is, is they ran every direction. And so the cowboys had to gather them back up, turn them back into the herd, and it might take two or three days, and they lost that time. I have seen a picture. This is not the one. There's an actual picture of the lightning uh, traveling across the horns of the herd, and it is, it's spooky to see that. And it didn't hurt them, I guess. So. No. What did I do? Sorry. 
you have to bear with me. Okay, uh, this is not where we should be, and I apologize. Let me see if I go back and find anything now. Um, this is uh, this is called chinning the moon, and I, I had this in a, a former presentation, but it's when the horse jumps straight up and all four of its hoofs are off the ground. And it's a, it's a saying that you'll only hear from the oldest cowboys around. And this is just for fun. Saw a spider and jumped. <laughs> a couple of the jobs that were not uh, on the favorite list for the drovers was night riders. And I love this picture. It just looks so calm and peaceful with the moon ri rising. But what it really was was the riders were riding around the herd, keeping them calm and quiet watching for Indians that did stay, uh, steal a cow, uh, a cow or two uh, when they could get to it. Um, but I imagine that it was probably pretty soothing to go to sleep listening to the gentle mooing and lowing of the cows. They took shifts on the night, on the night shift, night riding, and they had to, you know, keep them calm all night long, and then the next day they just had to ride and sleep in their saddle because there was no catching up. And I love this one, too. I call it Moonlight Sonata. You can see them lowing. This was uh, the least favorite job of the, of the trail crew. It was riding a drag. And you can imagine what that means. It means you're at the very back of the herd, probably the new guy on the, on the uh, hire, and had to ride behind them and keep them in order and eat tons of dust. This is a, a really great part of the story. Old Blue. Old Blue was his faithful steer that led his cattle drives. And he was really kind of a, a steel blue. And this actually was taken by uh, some uh, people that did a check wagon for dinner for us, and they had followed the Goodnight Trail and came upon this seer standing by itself, and we all figured, that's got to be old blue. Um, let me read a, a section from J. Frank Doby's uh, book. It says, old blue took his place at the point, and there he held it. I don't know what that's doing. I'm sorry. And there he held it. Powerful, sober, and steady, he understood the least motion of the point men, and in guiding the herd showed himself worth a dozen extra hands. For more than eight years, Blue, with a copper bell tied around his neck, and I should have a picture of Blue. I might just leave it like that. <laughs> Can you explain to me why this is happening, guys? I'm hitting the bottom button. Okay, well... You'll never forget this presentation, will you? Uh, anyway, uh, he was more for more than eight years, Blue, with a copper bell tied around his neck, led herds up trails he knew better than the cowboys. He helped corral wild cattle, cross turbulent rivers, and calm stampedes. During nights on the trail, Blue wandered into camp and helped himself, I hope this one works, yeah, and helped himself to the evening fare with the encouragement of the cowboys and the aggravation of the cook. And Blue did not sleep with the cattle. He slept with the royalty of the horses. He knew he was above and that he knew what his job was. And he died at the age of 20 in Paladuro Canyon. And I have had uh, discussions with some people that said he was never here. And I say, BS, he was here at Rock Canyon. And when I... Uh, Back on uh, the picture that said Beryl Goodnight, she's an artist who lives in Mancos. She's a sculptress and an art uh, painter, and she's fabulous. And she is a great niece of Goodnight uh, from the brothers because Goodnight had no children. But she uh, does bison and longhorn, not exclusively, but a lot. And she is always a part of our art show, and uh, she is donating old mod and calf to the barn when we have it secured and ready to go, and it's beautiful. And those are the longhorns that he actually hung from Old Blue 
in his, uh, at his home in Texas. Annie Blake bought the Nolan, Gervasio Nolan grant, and it was a Mexican grant, and it took up um, all the way from the St. Charles River uh, along the Arkansas to Wetmore and down to Go uh, Greenhorn along the St. Charles and back to the Arkansas. She sold one third of it to Peter Dotson, and he, uh, his cabin has been, is being restored in Beulah right now. They found an 1869 cabin in wonderful shape and uh, third to Goodnight. And the two ranchers, and uh, actually Dotson was the three-hour ranch. You've probably heard that. He started the th three-hour ranch. Um, they used to run cattle all over each other's just to share it. And uh, Annie sold it for 5000 to each one of them and ended up with a third free. I thought that was a pretty good businesswoman. And this is the Gervasio Nolan grant. Uh, you can see where Pueblo is. You can see that it went all the way, uh, and this, is, this would have been Wetmore, Greenhorn. Uh, it actually was, uh, then went up this way, and this was the V Hill and St. Grain grant that was so much larger, and everybody knows about that one. This is the uh, oldest picture we have of the land, and I'm can't even remember where we got it, but I, I think it's between 1890 and 1900. And this is if you were standing at the barn looking east. This is what you would see. And right now, there's a, a parking lot for the fishing in the, in the ponds there. And um, I learned something from one of the rangers that said that cottonwoods only live 100 years. So these cottonwoods are long gone, but there's new ones that took their place. And this should be looking to the west, and of course that's modern day, and they wouldn't have seen any of the wires, but that basically is what he saw when he saw this land. What, oh geez. What we saw, um, what I found, and I, I, got, I got this from a gentleman at uh, the museum down near Goodnight, and it is a wood engraving from a book that was published in 1874, but he visited the Goodnight Ranch in 1869, and this is what they saw. And it makes me so happy to see this. It's before the barn, and it's actually before his house. What I think we're seeing is the small barn that, that was there pri uh, previously, and two adobe houses that belonged to a guy named Peck and his garden, But because Goodnight had just taken over this property. But it's really cool to see that and know that he's part of this, this uh, book and legend. Sorry. This is cool. This is the earliest known photo of the barn. Same era as the one looking east. Uh, figure it's between 1890 and 1900, but it shows the stone corral, which we put up partially again. Um, windmill, bunkhouse, uh, and a carriage coming out, which was really weird because there's now a, a door right here. And uh, we don't know when that was put in, but obviously it wasn't there originally. It might have been put in when it was a dairy. So somewhere actually more like 1912 and to 1970, I found this out recently. Uh, it was a barn or a dairy barn that was owned by the Hudspeth family, and there's still a couple of Hudspeths in the area. Gijo is the one that has helped me uh, look for pictures of this, and he told me the story, which is very appropriate and timely, that the family actually rode out the 1921 flood in the hayloft. Look how close they were to the river. They had to have lost cattle and everything, but they didn't know about that. They never heard that from their grandparents or great-grandparents. So this is a picture of Charlie at some point here. Uh, when he came to Pueblo, he was 34, and he had been sweet on a, on a gal named uh, Mary, and she was living in Texas. I swear I'm hitting it correctly. Um, We'll just have fun with this. Her name was Mary, Ma and they called her Molly Dyer. 
and she had been born in Kentucky but was living in Texas with relatives. They finally, she finally said, you know what, or get off the pot. And so he said, all right, we'll get married. They w actually went back to Kentucky uh, to, to marry, and then when they were coming back, um, they rode the train as far west as it went at that point, and then they took the stagecoach, and they went to Texas first, and then they came up to Pueblo by stagecoach. And about 65 miles south, uh, they came across uh, some people that, uh, a, a group of people that were stranded because the Co Gang, which was a, a gang that, you know, robbers and thieves, well known in the area, had stolen all of their mules and horses and left them destitute. And Goodnight was a good old boy, and he said, I'll send back horses, and he did. And they got to Pueblo, and that's her younger, I'm sorry, I'm behind, uh, I guess. They got to Pueblo, and they spent the night at the Drover's Inn, which is on Santa Fe, or was on Santa Fe. It's no longer there. Is that me? It might be me. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they spent the night, and during the night, the gang, the co-gang was captured and brought back to be put in jail in Pueblo, and the people of Pueblo had a different idea. So they hung them. And the next morning, her first night there, Molly got up, looked out the window, and saw a body hanging from a telegraph pole and lost it. And she said to Charlie, I don't want to be here. I want to go back to Texas. You guys are too, you know, I don't know what the word she would have used, but she didn't think much of Pueblo. And he looked at her, and, and I've read this in several books, so I think it's true. He looked at her, and he said, really very gravely, but Mary, I don't think it hurt the telegraph pole. <laughs> I can't believe that he actually said that, but it's in several books, guys, so, you know. Anyway, and what he did to soothe her was he got together some of the more prominent people in Pueblo, the Thatchers were one group, probably the Carlisles and some others, and he took them all, they all went up to Manitou Springs, which wasn't just a hop, skip, and a jump at that point, and they spent two weeks camping and getting to know each other, and she decided at the end of that time that she really liked them, and she wanted to stay. Oh, and I, I should probably point out, if you see this up here, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's El Pueblo, Fort El Pueblo, and it would have been about 15 years after the massacre, and I'm, I'm just anxious, I need to do a little bit more research on it. I've never seen a picture of Fort El Pueblo, but it was captured in the background. Of course, where do you think this picture was taken from? Goat Hill, which was tender, Tenderfoot Hill at that point. Charlie and Molly became prominent, well-known citizens, and he had a partial ownership in the Stock Growers Bank. I'm not sure where the first location was, but the second one is, is at the Greenlight Tavern on 3rd and Santa Fe. He also built, uh, helped build the Methodist Church, First Methodist Church, and I believe that was probably Molly's idea because I think he'd probably never seen the inside of a church. Um, and he and uh, the Thatchers started the first Stock Raisers Association in Pueblo in 1871. I've had some uh, thoughts about this plat map, and I thought at first it was one of the first, uh, when he first bought the property, but then I realized it shows the orchard, it shows the barn right here with the corral, and the house, and the bluffs, of course. It's very much there now in the old channel. You can look and see that on any map. You can tell where the barn was. And when I realized that there was an orchard and everything, and the barn was, the old, the stone barn was built, it was probably more like 1874, and I think he was in the middle of trying to sell the property at that point, and it would have been something he had had done. Whoops, there's Charlie at about 35. Handsome guy, just my type. Dark, handsome. Um, in 1876, well, actually, I should go back. 1873, there was a financial panic, 
and he lost a lot of money. He had to sell, he had lots of lots and farmland. He sold it all, he still couldn't make it. And so in 1876, he decided he was gonna pull up stakes and move to the Paladero Canyon, which is familiar to him from his regiment days and from his Texas Ranger days. And it's really very pretty, at least in this picture. <laughs> he built himself a dugout, I think. There we go. He built himself a dugout, and he lived in that for a while, and he even brought Mary there. And it was made with Comanche lodge poles, old ones, and cedar logs and cottonwood. And that was his home for probably at least a year, maybe more. At that point, he, oh sheesh, there's another picture of it. Uh, at that point, he threw in with, um, I apologize, We'll get there. Okay, John Adair at the J.A. Ranch. And he stayed with him for 11 years. And he grew that ranch to a million acres and several hundred thousand cattle. And then in 1888, he branched off. Uh, well, actually, he still he had time to do this. He had vigilante justice. And he ended up riding with the, the, the people that you know weren't going to wait for the law because the law wasn't very much around at that point and he hung his share of men. So he wasn't perfect. You'll remember this presentation, won't you? In 1888, he built his own home on his own ranch. And I think that it's very similar to the house that they must have had at Rock Canyon, which actually burned in 1884. I found it in the newspaper. We knew it had burned, nobody knew exactly when. And Molly's one love was bison. She loved the bison, and she knew they were decimated, and she knew that there were probably just a few hundred left. And so she brought them onto her ranch, and she protected them and grew them into a larger herd. And uh, they are what we believe is what saved the southern bison herd. And I say bison, I know everybody knows buffalo, and it took me a long time to change my, my thought on that. But buffalo are the ones that you see that in Africa, the water buffalo, these are bison, Diff a little bit different. And Goodnight gave half of his herd, or about half of his herd, to the uh, Pueblo Indians in Taos. And they still have a herd, and there's still a herd in Capstone, hi guy, uh, that is, descendant from the original Goodnight Herd, which I think is terrific. It's the only pure purebred herd. This guy, I think he's really handsome. Um, Goodnight decided he was gonna experiment and he actually uh, crossed bison, a male bison with a female cow. And it was a great idea, because look how beefy he is. It would have gotten twice the meat out of him, but mamas couldn't carry him. They had very few births. I mean, how would you like it, ladies? <laughs> this, you know, is probably twice the size of a regular calf. And if they didn't lose it during the pregnancy, they certainly lost it at the birth. I know. And this is fun, okay? In 1916, Goodnight, who was always getting into something, actually did a silent film called Old Texas. And uh, let me tell you before I get started on it that we have that film and we will be showing it at the Pueblo Heritage Museum in the near future. We usually do our Heritage Nights on Wednesday, but, beca but because of Gregory's wonderful planning here, we'll change the day and it won't be on Wednesday. But it's 38 minutes long and it is what I would really call camp. I mean, he had real Kiowa Indians, he had his stock hands and cowboys in it, uh, real chuck wagons, real wagons, everything was true to form. And there's even one scene that I just can't get out of my head because it's so silly, but he's got a, a Kiowa chief on his horse, standing on a promontory, going or sitting on his horse on a promontory, going like this. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, you know. <laughs> and that is what you would see in an old John Wayne movie or even earlier than that, or Grant Withers, if you know who Grant Withers is. Does anybody know who that is? Okay, good. Well, Grant Withers was in most of John Wayne's movies, and he was from here, so. 
Yeah, well, it's, and this is good night during the filming. You think he's a little bow-legged? I think he rode a horse for a little, maybe too many years, but you can see some of the Indians. Uh, this guy's got a, I don't know, T-shirt on? I'm not sure what that is, but anyway, um, and this is the last picture that I can find of Molly and Charlie together in about 1916 when the movie was filmed. Molly died in 1926, and Goodnight became very ill, and he had been corresponding with a, a gal named Corrine Goodnight, who was out of Butte, Montana, and when she found that he was ill, she came down to nurse him back, and I think she probably had alternative ideas, which worked out for her, because he married her on his 91st birthday, and she was 26. He looks like a little devil, doesn't he? <laughs> Unfortunately, and, and story has it that she was pregnant and that she lost it, and my question was, who was the father? <laughs> so, and that's the original Goodnight gravestone. Uh, it's in Goodnight, Texas, which is the town that came up around his, his uh, actual uh, ranch. Let me get where I'm going here and see if I'm not missing anything. I'm actually just doing this by rote now. I'm proud of myself because usually I need some notes. Um, I don't know if this is going to show it because I'm not sure about this. Yeah, okay, this is his brand, the PAT brand, and he registered this in 1871 in Pueblo County. Now, if anybody knows, it's the state that registers brands, but back then each county had their own register. And so in 1871, this is what he registered, and he had another one that was PAT-M, which was Molly's, and nobody, I haven't met anybody that knows what PAT means, and I, I have a feeling that if I dug really deep into Texas history, it might have come back from up from Texas with him, but I don't know for sure. So this is just a standard picture of, of uh, cattle branding, and it took five guys to do this, and this is, I just think this is the cutest little picture. <laughs> Ouch, that hurt. Um, when Goodnight was traveling after Loving died, he decided to come over Raton Pass. And that's the old pass there. And fortunately or unfortunately, it was owned by Dick Wooten, Uncle Dick Wooten, for you historians. And he decided he was going to make a little money since he owned that land and he wanted to charge 10 cents per, per head, be it man or beast. And Goodnight, who didn't have the longest temper, got a little bit upset and said, I'll pay you this time, but you'll never see me again. And Wooten said, ha, 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 there's no other way. We'll see you again. Well, Goodnight was right and he was wrong. And there's a picture of crusty old Uncle Dick and he was a trapper from way back. I mean, we're talking about the 40s. Um, so he went 37 miles east over Trinchera Pass. And Trinchera was less hazardous, easier for the cows and the, and the wagons. And I believe I have, I do have uh, something that talks about his travel over Trinchera. It's a little bit... Um, I, I couldn't find it. I, I couldn't follow it. I tried to follow it on a map. I need to find an older map to do this. But in the spring of 1968, Goodnight drove a herd of cattle up south Trinchera Creek, then over Trinchera Pass, which lay east of Raton Pass, then down north Trinchera Creek, then northwest and out of the mountains to Cola de Burro, or Tail of the Bur Burro, and Frijoles Arroyo, uh, the picket wire, Hole in the Rock, and passed a prominent hog back in the Apishapa River, then to the Orfano River, and then he crossed the Arkansas below Pueblo. I believe that was what he was telling his biographer, uh, was the ro route he took. And one of these days, I'm going to find an old, old enough map to find Grijoles Arroyo, I love that, and the tail of the burrow. So here was the Apishapa Canyon, and when he drove his cattle over Trinchera, he knew that those they needed a rest, so he rested them in the Apishapa River area, plenty of grass, great water, and um, they stayed for several months to fatten up the, ca the cattle because they had lost weight on um, the trip, and he 
his camp was below this big hog pack. You may have seen it as you travel south to Trinidad. We learn um, from our dear friend Harry Vold, and you probably know the name. He was he he uh, dealt in rodeo stock. He was from Pueblo, and he uh, every rodeo or carnival or whatever he his stock was in it. Um, and he told us there were three cowboy graves down in the Apishapa. And we said, oh, sure, we want to see that. And he said, I'll take you there. So he rode along as we drove down there. It was quite a drive. And sure enough, it's called, it was called the Bow and Arrow Ranch. I'm not sure what it's called now. The Land Conservancy has taken over because it was in bankruptcy. But there were three graves, and they were surrounded by a fence and actually kind of taken care of. And if you can see this one, this is, uh, oops, go back. Sorry. This is W.M. Thorpe, and the story is he died in 1871. He was struck on his horse with, by lightning. And he was a Texas cavalryman, and because it's a newer stone, I swear I'm going to find it sometime, but I'm pretty sure the Texas cavalry takes care of their own, and they probably put this in there. The middle one is a young man named J.T. Callahan, and he died of snake bite in 1869. The one on the left is supposedly a woman and baby. I have no way of knowing. All of this information came from one of the commissioners down in Los Animas con uh, County, who was fairly elderly, but her father had grown up abutting this area and would have been about 120 now, and this is the story he had. There's lots of stories that they drowned in the Apishapa, but I don't believe that's what happened. Harry thought they drowned, but this is what this woman had told us. It was so cool to see those. And then uh, there's the remains of a rock house at the Apishapa that was used by the drovers uh, as they stayed there for a few months. And what's really amazing is that uh, there is uh, rock uh, fences and Goodnight used everything in the area, what was there, and he always built rock fences. And up until a few years before we had been there, the, general, the manager of the ranch said, you won't believe this, but there were still leather straps where the gates were after 150 years. Traveling uh, north, and it would have been east of I-25, this, is, this was part of his pass here. And he did come to a spot east of Colorado Springs called Corral Bluffs. And I think I have pictures of that. And it was a natural formation, and he could camp his herd there for the night or two and rest them. But the really special place about it is it had something. <laughs> it had a buffalo jump. Do you know what a buffalo jump is? You can kind of look at it and see. This was probably before the Indians had many uh, guns, and so they would get behind the herd and stampede them over the cliff. And it sounds sad because they broke legs and fell on each other and died, but the Indians used every portion of that bison. That was their livelihood, so we have to know that. And they blessed everything that they ate or killed, and that was their religion. Charlie had uh, several uh, line camps. One was on the Ape uh, one was on St. Charles River. One was on the Hard Scrabble, and he also owned a smaller ranch called Babcock Hole. And Bob Babcock's Hole is owned by uh, Robert and Joan Hamilton. I don't know if you know them. He used to own all the emergency cares in the area, and they have had this ranch for quite some time. And they have a herd of registered Texas Longhorns and a herd of bison that they keep in memory of Goodnight. And they have been very generous with us. This is the barn since it's been pretty much restored. And it's got some snow on it. You can't see the shake roof, which I, I was in awe that the State Historical Fund allowed us to put a wood roof on. I was sure they would say, no, you have to put on something that looks like it. Um, but. It was falling down. Um, you can ask my husband. We were out there when the architects were telling us that the, the west wall was nine inches off, leaning this way. And the gentleman and his crew that did the block work did an excellent job. And instead of taking every block out, numbering it, and putting it back, they took big cables and pulled it up and saved us about $80,000.
back in uh, the early days, uh, we all know that the uh, Arkansas was our border with Mexico. And uh, after the Mexican War in 1848, the border was moved down to where it is now, along with the Gadsden Purchase, which was Arizona Territory. And um, this whole area went back and forth from Spain to France to Spain, and then it became part of the Republic of Texas. Um, I'm sure I'm missing something to tell you here. Let's see. Um, it was uh, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that brought this into our, into our land. If you were a cowboy at that point, oops, we passed the cowboys and went right on to the next kind of vaqueros. Um, the vaqueros were a huge, huge su support system for our cowboys. Nobody knew uh, the, the longhorns and cattle ranching like they did. And we should all be proud that they, s that they came up and taught us all that. This is our typical cowboy picture. And they were obviously cleaned up for the photographer. They wouldn't have looked like that out on the range. But they had their chaps and, and everything. If you were to look up a uh, cowboy or trail hand on the internet now, this is likely the picture you would see. And I pointed out because this guy had everything he needed on his horse, pretty much. He had rope. He had a canteen, he had his rifle, he had his bedroll, and whatever else was hidden under there. And he could go anywhere with his horse. And, and you know, he'd have to find his own food, but he had his water. Um, I sh I've already shown this, I apologize. Um, back to the Mexican vaqueros, I want you to notice how beautiful their horses were. They were well taken care of. Uh, a lot of them wore, uh, rode Andalusians, which were Spanish horses that had come over. And they taught our cowboys how to take care of their horses and the cattle. I can tell you that they were the ones that uh, taught the cowboys. They taught them, uh, well, first of all, vaquero is the Spanish root word for buckaroo or cowboy. So that's where that came from. And they taught our cowboys about the longhorns, breeding, stock laws, roping, equipment, and land grants. And words that are infused into our Western language now, like lariat, corral, remuda, charo, chaps, they all come from the vaquero. Um, Bose Icard was a uh, good night's trusted trail hand, or actually it was his trail manager. And um, I have. I will read you what Goodnight said about Bose when he died. Bose Icard was a good bronc rider, a top night herder, a good cook, and surpassed any man I had in endurance and stamina. He was reliable, could hold his own in a fight, and was the most devoted man that Goodnight had ever had. Bose Icard was Goodnight's range boss and trusted companion, and Goodnight always had Bose carry his money back and forth to the bank for him, knowing full well that nobody would think that the, the cowboy or the black uh, man would have the money on him. Don't know if you remember when I talked about hole in the wall was one of the uh, landmarks that, that they actually saw. Um, here it is. And this is in Thatcher, Colorado. It's on private land. Don't try to go see it. They might shoot you. Um, but they were very good to us in, in showing us uh, the pictures of it. I think when you start talking about history that had to do with their own land and everything, you know, they were very uh, willing to help us. Uh, the, the black cowboy uh, is famous. Nat Turner is the most famous one we've heard of. And, about, and most, a lot of the ex-slaves went west for a new life. And about a quarter of them were black. This is an iconic picture, and I think it talks, it tells a lot about Goodnight and his love for the bison and the West. They both have the same expression, <laughs> and they're both facing the same way. And Goodnight was probably in his late 80s at this time, and I'm not sure who did this picture, but I just, it's one of my favorites. And this was Goodnight at about 80. 
Goodnight took his final ride on his horse Buttons in the mid-twenties. When he dismounted, he handed the reins to his foreman's wife, Retta Hubbard, and gave her his horse and saddle, and that's the last time he ever got on a horse. Um, Retta Hubbard's family descendants still live in the area, and I have been fortunate. They've come up and come to our art show, and uh, the mother, she's actually the daughter of Retta's son, uh, is probably not going to live a lot longer, and she supposedly has tons of good night stuff, but she doesn't want anybody to see it just yet. So I'm in line. This is going to be kind of exciting for you. This is the inside of the barn in 2013 before we started to work on it. But I want to point out that these are all hand-hewed, and the beams, the rafters, the posts, they are all pine. There's no pine around here. It came from Wetmore. So they hauled all these down from Wetmore. And the, the main, uh, what would it, not the, the beam, uh, is two 35-foot pieces of pine, and I'm just in awe of how they got those down here. Uh, and they did all the work themselves. They didn't have uh, a sawmill or anything like that. Then, and this, oh, I should go back. This is actually, this shows you, um, well, it was, uh, there was a lot of uh, coating on it that, and, and this is the uh, a cement where the barn, the dairy barn was, and these were the, the, the uh, runners where they flushed the, the milk down. That had to come out when we restored it. And we took all of the uh, whitewash off and we had to replace a few of the beams and rafters, but not very many. Most of it is original. And this shows the middle uh, posts, and you can see they weren't just straight up and down. They were kind of fancy. And we had heard about a Spanish uh, family of, uh, excuse me, a uh, Swedish family of carpenters that was in the area, and we believe they had something to do with this. That's the barn today. It is, I've never thought, yep, I never thought that I would say that a barn is gorgeous, but it's gorgeous. And I have had call after call for Western weddings, and we're getting there, folks, we're getting there. Um, barn dances, uh, our annual chuck wagon dinner, we have a collaboration with the American Chuck Wagon Association out of Texas, but they have members all over the country, and they have agreed to come up once a year and do a, a chuck wagon cook-off, and I think that will be fantastic. And they are excited because Goodnight invent, invented the chuck wagon. They think that's where they should be. Once again, here's the barn in 1974, and here it is now. You can see it's solid. Uh, a story is, is that on every wall in a stone barn, there's a white rock. And we don't know exactly what it means, but if you walk around the barn, you'll see one on each side. This is the barn at night, and I have to say that I've never been out there to see it. <laughs> but my husband took this picture for me, and I think it's just beautiful. And they use the same straps on the old doors and put them on the new doors. This is my last slide. I'm probably done. Oh, yeah, good. Anyway, this is the concept by the architect of what we could have out there at some point. And um, the barn, of course, and whether we put the corral back around, it would be a lot of work and a lot of rock. Uh, but we would love to have an interpretive center and some sort of pavilion uh, to have dances, although now we have a, a big uh, cement platform there parking area where we could have a dance. Um, put maybe some of the orchard back in. We'll never do the house because we're not sure what it, not sure what it looked like. Uh, but this is, this is where we are, and this is going to draw Western uh, enthusiasts, uh, children in the classroom, classrooms, and uh, just motor coaches, all sorts of things. I'm sure it's going to be a busy, busy place. And I am just proud to have been a part of this for seven years, and I hope I live long enough to see it in full force and effect. So I want to thank you all. I know that I had some technical issues, but I think the, uh, the actual history was pretty solid. So thank you very much.